just passed the midterm in Grenada, where Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell is ruling, having won all the seats in Parliament following the 2013 vote. Well, we have on the line Barbados-based political analyst and pollster Peter Wickham, whom we have asked to join for a midterm analysis of the politics in Grenada. Peter, thank you for joining us. Now, give us your analysis of the politics of Grenada as it stands today. Well, um, a midterm in a situation where you have all the seats is, is something that Grenadians are familiar with. So I guess against that background, you look back to see what was happening in a similar situation after Mitchell won all the seats the first time around. Um, my sense is that the outcome of the next election is almost a foregone conclusion. And I think the real question is, will how many seats will the opposition win, if any, and what kind of situation the opposition is in. So I think it, it's a somewhat unusual environment in which um, the focus is more on the opposition and what the opposition can bring to the fore um, than, than is, has historically or than would normally be the case in a situation where you're looking at a regular government full term. It's, it's something the Canadians are familiar with, but at the same time, this time around, you're looking at constitutional reform. Uh, and, a, and a possible referendum, which, which Mitchell has agreed to put on the table. So I think that the question really is, what kind of condition is the opposition in? Um, how will the referendum impact on it? Certainly, how will the constitutional change impact on the opposition's fortune? Uh, and generally, how, how is the government doing? Recession, uh, how are they battling it, and so on. And, and those, to me, are the, the major focal points as we look at a, a midterm situation. Given what you have just said, what would you say is a potential weak side of this current Mitchell administration? Yeah, well, I think the economy clearly is it. Uh, the, the fact that people gave the the NDC and NP, sorry, all all of the seats and, and gave Mitchell such a uh, Mitchell such uh, uh, a resounding majority suggests that they have very high expectations for him to be able to deliver. And, and the main area of delivery is investment employment, uh, economic returns, uh, and that really, to me, is will be his Achilles heel. Has he been doing enough to deliver it? Uh, he entered into a structural adjustment program initially. Um, there has been considerable economic pain, and as we look towards the end of that program, and I think that that program ends in a matter of months, um, the hope will be that things will start looking up. The quantity of taxation and so on would have eased, uh, and there has been considerable investment in, in Grenada. Uh, I've seen several large projects going up, certainly at least two or three, uh, and one would assume that with the size of Grenada, projects of that nature will have almost uh, immediate effect, uh, and people should start to start to feel the benefits of it. So the Achilles heel to me is the economy. Uh, I think that's really where the focus is, to see whether or not his, um, his structural adjustment period in the program, which has been so warmly endorsed by the people of Grenada, has, has, has been able to deliver um, serious uh, benefits. But the government has had three years of economic growth, as high as 5% last year, they have said. Yeah, Does definitely. That, doesn't that make any difference? Yeah, and I, I agree that the indicators are, are good. But I think beyond the whole question of economic growth, because economic growth on a macro level is always something that people um, like to see. But I think the average Grenadian now who is, is feeling some pressure from the level of taxation, which was increased. Uh, is hoping that that can be also easy. And I think that really will be the question. Not so much economic growth, yes, that's, that's important, but the actual individual to have more money in the pocket, pay less taxes, and, and be able to see more investment opportunities. It has been the view here by some that the, op the opposition has not been able to gain traction. They have not caught fire. And since they have a new leader, what, in your view, has been the reason for this? Well, I mean, the, the fact is the opposition is not really being led by a new leader. The opposition is being led by a person who I think was rejected along with all the others. Um, my, my sense is that the, the individual who should be leading the opposition is not now a member of parliament. Uh, and I think the opposition, and I've said this before, I think the opposition made a, a fundamental error. The NDC made a fundamental error when they attempted to persist in the last election with, with the leadership that was clearly not working out. Um, they have now chosen uh, an alternative leader, which is Nazim Burke. Uh, and I don't know that, that Nazim necessarily has the stuff that people are looking for. I mean, you're, you're unable to gain support in your constituency and get a seat. But yes, you emerge as a leader of the opposition. And the party decides that this is the person that they want then to, to take, take people forward. So to me, the, the conversation has not changed. And that's really the important thing that we talk about 
um, a new opposition leader, but there's no new opposition leader. The, the, the conversation in the NDC has not changed in probably the last 30 years. And I think that, that Nazim Burke, um, as an alternative, uh, it's probably not going to fill people's eyes now any more than it did in the last election because it's the same group. So my thing is, the, the NDC has to ask itself a serious question. Are you going to continue to persist with the, the same mistakes that have been leading you to lose all of the seats twice? Or alternatively, are you going to um, look to identify, package, and present alternative political leadership? That, that definitely has some, some level of vision and that can take the country forward, take the party forward. So who can the opposition really look to then to help revive the NDC? Well, I don't know. I mean, they, they have to know who, who they want to look to. Uh, when, when I did the last set of surveys, when the NDC was having some challenges internally, Peter David was the person that people preferred as an alternative to, to Prime Minister Thurman Thomas. Um, I don't know whether Peter Davis is in a position now to take over leadership of anything within the NDC because my sense is that he, his ties with that organization have been severed. Uh, so he would be the person that I would have thought would have made sense as an alternative when things didn't work out in the last election. Um, if, if the NDC has decided that they're not going with him and that they want to go with someone else, I think that they have to do uh, something akin to what the SLP did uh, with Dr. Kenny Anthony um, back in, in the 90s. Find someone who you believe has the stuff, bring that person, uh, install that person as leader of the party, and attempt to, to use that person to, to gain ascendancy. Um, that's what the, the St. Lucia Labour Party did with some success, and, and it, it scored political dividends. My, my feeling is that the NDC prefers to, to persist with these, this, this group that has been tried and tested and has failed repeatedly. Instead of looking outside and looking to, to Grenadians in the diaspora, Grenadians at home, Grenadians that may not necessarily be part of this political conversation, but can, can raise the, the political stakes a notch. And then there is the Peter David factor. Yeah. Has there been any significance? Um, that's, that's interesting. I really don't know. I think Peter has to decide what he, he wants to do and where he wants to go. Um, I think it's widely believed that he will now embrace the NNP more warmly. Um, personally, it would have been, I would have preferred if he could have made the kind of political strides that he's making now within the NDC. Uh, certainly it would have made a lot more sense to the NDC as a party, but I guess if the party doesn't want you, then you know, you go in the alternative. But I think his political future looks relatively bright right now. I mean, he, he, he was a minister in a previous administration. Um, the presumption is that he could become a minister in the future if you want. So I think that's a good place to be. But the, the, the real interest, I think, is the extent to which people see him as a future leader of the country, uh, whether they saw that in the past under the NEC regime or whether they see him as a future option. No. Um, it's certainly entirely possible that he could emerge in the conversation. I mean, Dr. Mitchell uh, is not a young person, and one would assume that at some stage he will, he will want to, to retire. Um, and then it would be a question of whether or not people in that party would be willing to embrace him as one as he was embraced within the NDC, well, initially. So um, I, I don't know that he is any worse off. I think when I compare him with other leaders across the region or other individuals across the region, who have had challenges within the party internally. I think that he's handled himself relatively well. And I'm speaking about people like Clyde Masco. Uh, we have a, a young lady in Barbados who's also having some issues with the party. But I think that compared to a number of people who have had these kinds of issues within the political organizations, I think he's done, he's done reasonably well. Uh, and I think that he's positioned now that he can make some kind of an impact. Thank you very much, Peter, for your insightful analysis. And with that, it is time to wrap up this edition of Corridors of Power. In the next edition of Corridors of Power, we hope to have the latest from the politics in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as well as more from Haiti again. But for now, we bring the curtains down on this edition. Until next time, continue speaking truth to power.